to all of our followers on Facebook for joining us here for our very first um, lecture um, via um, Facebook Live. Um, it's great to have you with us today. Um, as you know, our churches are sadly closed at present um, due to the COVID-19 lockdown, but there's lots of ways that you can still engage with our amazing collection of churches and the rich heritage that we care for on behalf of the nation. Um, we're shortly going to be releasing a series of walks that you can do around our churches. And we've got a series of free online resources for you to do from home, such as quizzes, um, activities for families, um, and much more. So do have a look on our website, which is visitchurch.org.uk for those free resources. We're also going to be putting on a series of lectures such as this. This is our very first one and these will be free for you to um, watch, um, share and enjoy. Um, we hope that you maybe feel, um, you know, you enjoy these lectures but that you'd be wanting to maybe help us um, support and protect our churches. So there's a couple of ways that you can make a donation. You can firstly go to our website but there's a really easy way for your text donation and um, that you can text three pounds and the way you do that is just text CCT in capitals to 70331. And that will just text three pounds as a gift to help us protect and care for our churches. But I'm going to hand over to our chief executive, Peter Reyes, who's going to talk to you today um, about 50 years of CCT, um, what we've done over the last 50, year, 50 years in caring for our churches in our collection, and also what the future holds for parish churches. So over to you, Peter, and feel free to share your screen. Thank you, George. Uh, just bear with us while we deal with the technology. Um, as you will be probably aware, this is our first uh, attempt to do this on Facebook Live, so um, we'll see how well this works uh, and we can iron out any problems that there are. Thank you all for joining us today. Really pleased to have you with us uh, and I hope to give you some insights into the past uh, of the Church's Conservation Trust and really into the future um, of what the impact of all of this might mean and what it means for our beautiful historic churches in this country, in England. Um, so the Church Conservation Trust was 50 years old last year, uh, formed in 1969. Uh, an amazing partnership between church and state that's gone for 50 years. So there's still money put in from the government and there's still money put in from the church commissioners. And obviously we earn a lot of that money ourselves. And really the whole thing was testament to the man that you'll see in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen there, a, a man called Ivor Bulmer Thomas, who, um, if you read anything about him, you will just feel like you're an underachiever. This man is an amazing man of, of great uh, energy, stamina and enthusiasm. Um, he had quite a humble beginning, um, and, uh, but went on to Oxford, to St. John's College, where he got first in mathematics. Um, and um, he was also a, a, an outstanding athlete. He nearly, he nearly represented uh, the country in the 1928 Olympics. And it's, um, it's very likely, well, he did know a lot of the people who ended up being the characters in Chariots of Fire. I'm sure if you remember uh, that movie. Um, he went into politics in, in 1942 and started out with the Labour Party and served there for till 1948 and then he switched uh, to the Conservative Party in 1949 and served for a, for a year there. Uh, he did hold some ministerial posts um, and um, during this time as well he started getting very involved in, um, in, in, in his love for historic churches uh, which became something of a, of, a, of a thing for him because he started out as a non-conformist actually and then ended up his life uh, very much um, an Anglican and um, very much in the Anglo-Catholic tradition as well but this what he identified at the time really was that there was a, a significant problem with churches closing uh, Anglican churches particularly very highly listed ones um, and um, that there was nothing happening to them they were being demolished um, they were um, clearing the way for a, a new world um, of modernism uh, through the country and, and what was being lost was a huge amount of heritage and he set up in 1957 I think the Friends of Friendless Churches so, who were older than us um, as a means of protecting some of these churches um, but he, he managed to get the investment of church and state into what was then called the Redundant Churches Fund uh, which then in turn became the CCT, the Churches Conservation Trust, um, through his work. And the first 
building that we secured was this particular church in Edlington in South Yorkshire. And it was great to go here last year um, in, in our 50th anniversary year to see this building again with a roof on now. You can see the state of the building uh, as it was um, in a, a mining village in South Yorkshire. Uh, this building has genuinely been saved uh, and is still standing through the through works of the um, church's conservation trust uh, and a beautiful Norman building um, with later additions to it. Uh, this when we were there for the 50th anniversary it was really really good to hear a choir singing and they were singing uh, the music of Talis and Bird who if you're if you're aware of these um, pieces of music there these these um, these composers survived the great reformation the transformation of this from a Catholic country to being a uh, an Anglican country, I suppose, um, and to hear these this music playing out in this building and the resonance uh, of this music in this building was a very powerful and moving moving experience. Um, the vesting so vesting is what's called when the legal process of giving a church to the church's conservation trust is called vesting uh, a, a very peculiar word um and it, we took um uh, a barrister's advice on what this meant and it means we kind of own them but we don't um so we're generously given these buildings by the church commissioners uh, when they're no longer required for regular parish use and then um we have to look after them on behalf of the nation, which is something we very much enjoy doing uh, in perpetuity. So we have to look after them forever on behalf of the nation because they're of such significant historic value and there is no other use that can be, uh, they can be put to. So in the 70s, um, the ownership of our churches really ramped up uh, and within about six years, uh, we had um, 100 odd historic churches on our books already uh, which is quite a, a rapid acceleration of buildings to care for and this was still under the auspices of Ivor Bulmer Thomas because uh, he was still chair of the um, of the well the redundant churches fund as it was until 1976. Um, this particular picture is really, really pertinent. This is St. Peter Sudbury. We're just about to submit a very big funding bid for this church right in the, in the heart of Sudbury. We've been working with the local community. Uh, fundraising has been going on really successfully uh, to bring this building back um, into oh dear that's not a good sign is it uh, to bring it back into uh, into use um as we um uh, as a, a really sound resource for the town of sudbury itself um absolutely fantastic projects and fantastic building that there were so i'm still sharing my screen aren't i sorry about this i'll get you back in a second i uh, told you this was an experiment and uh, we'd have to deal with the vagaries of um of the uh computers and broadband and all the things that they do there there we should be back again I'm going to nod George if we're back yep okay so um so the trust um continued to acquire um buildings the pace of the acquisitions for the trust did slow down from that initial acceleration so there was clearly a need for the work of the church's conservation trust and really um very much specialized in extremely high quality conservation to the buildings that we took on uh, these are grade one and grade two star listed churches uh, the highest quality that no one could find any other usage for or any other use would would damage them particularly and we we're very proud to say that in 1991 um, there was recognition of this from the council of europe who uh, there's nothing quite like the church's conservation trust uh, anywhere else however there is one in a place called Groningen in, in the Netherlands um, who was set up in 1969 as well, celebrated their 50th anniversary last year, uh, but it's a more um, regional uh, body rather than an, a nationwide one. In 1992, um, the name changed um, from the Redundant Churches Fund to um, the Churches Conservation Trust. And in a way, I, I, I mourn the loss of this um, highly stylized pelican with its children pecking uh, its breast. And as those of you who are well versed in iconography in historic churches, uh, this, is, this is symbolic of, of Jesus uh, pecking his own breast to feed, his, his, feed the young. Um, and it's a, it's, it's a really pertinent symbol. But we did create something 
that was the church's conservation trust which more reflected what the organization was doing and didn't concentrate on the potentially negative word of redundant uh, it created the church's conservation trust which is a more positive organization and we chose a logo with the world's most enormous spire on a um, very small church as you can see there um, but branding is a very tricky thing and uh, as, as we learned as we went through another phase of this this year so we continue to acquire churches uh, at this pace a uh, slower pace as I said before and then um, as we moved into the 2000s uh, really uh, started beginning then to look at um, sort of rather larger projects than the sort of high quality just the high quality conservation work that we've been doing obviously we carried on with that high quality conservation but here you can see St Thomas's in Bristol um, which is uh, uh, St Thomas's St Paul's in Bristol sorry um, which is one of our, a real triumph of the of the of the church's conservation trust in partnership with a circus school called Circa Media and here um, with the support of the in the early days, I think of the Heritage Lottery Fund, which is now the National Lottery Heritage Fund, we created a project which has been sustained all this time and still thriving to this day, uh, whereby this beautiful, beautiful building uh, in Portland Square in Bristol has been transformed into a, um, a circus school a circus training school um i actually uh, when i took over as chief executive the first thing i did pretty much was go and learn how to trapeze upside down in this building because i thought it was a necessary thing to do if i was going to lead this organization but what this did was it moved us just from the uh, conservation of churches into the longer term sustainability of these buildings um it's been a tricky run, uh, St Paul's. Um, not easy because uh, obviously the, the the model is not a pure economic one. It's a it's about training and it's about um, providing space for circus skills. But it has endured. It has lasted, and it's a, an amazing venue. So when it reopens, all you people in Bristol, make sure you get down there to learn some circus skills. Because uh, I also tried unicycling there too. Uh, but also you can always hire it for for uh, for parties and uh, and things like that as well. It's an amazing amazing venue and, and a real success uh, through the partnership of the Church, Church Conservation Trust and Circa Media. Um, we didn't really do anything else on this scale. We'd continue to take these amazing um, countryside churches, mostly rural churches on through this period of time. Um, but in uh, 2014, we, um, we opened um, All Souls Bolton, which had taken an awful long time to produce, 10 years it took to take this building uh, into a new community use. And um, what's interesting about this building is a very large Victorian building in Bolton, in one of the poorest wards in the country. Um, the population is about 85% Asian Muslim. There were three mosques in about a 250 meter radius of the building. Um, and um, the uh, future of this was uncertain. There was a million pound repair bill that was needed on the building and it was propping up the local economy by providing good supply of lead from the roof. Um, so it was a very tricky site to deal with and um, but we worked very hard with an amazing local man called Inayat Amaji uh, who's a true inspiration to a lot of people because he he really had the vision for reusing this building as a great purpose for um, for the rest of the community uh, the building still remains consecrated as a place of worship but it serves the whole community it is all souls for all souls and again when this reopens I really highly recommend you go to the curry club because not only do you see this amazing piece of 21st century architecture which really complements the um, very high quality late 19th century architecture um, but the curry is brilliant too and very good value uh, as well so 2015, um, here you can see the former chief executive of the Church Conservation Trust, Crispin Truman, who's now chief executive of um, CPRE, the countryside charity, um, receiving a dedicated service award for our work um, that we'd done in the heritage field. This is a really prestigious prize. Uh, and this is in uh, is Oslo that we went to collect this prize. And it was a prize that came with some money as well, which was very much needed for the work that we do. Um, uh, but we're very, very proud of this achievement. And um, we have a lovely statue as well uh, a trophy in, in our office which we'll see again once we get back there um, 
we continue to look at the, um, the rural churches and look after those, but some other bigger projects that we're doing at the moment. On site at the moment is Holy Trinity Sunderland. The project's called Canny Space. Uh, we're actually building this at the moment. Uh, so COVID-19 has really got in the way of progress there. Uh, work stopped on site for a little while. They're back on site now, but it's much harder and slower to build this. Um, again, this is with the great support of the National Lottery Heritage Fund, um, who've been marvellous in supporting this. But again, here we are, the the um the original parish church of Sunderland uh, brought back into use again in one of the poorer wards of the of the city and out of the country actually uh, here we are using this amazing 18th century heritage uh, to to support um, local people in their lives and, and the economy and this is an amazing building. This was originally where the town council of Sunderland was. There was a library in here. The fire engine was kept in this building. It shows that multi-purpose use of historic churches is nothing new, absolutely nothing new. And we hope they have that open uh, later in the year. Also on site, or not at the moment is St Swithin's Worcester, uh, an, an incredible uh, building right in the heart of the city. Uh, and this building is going to be used for um, uh, arts arts usage uh, when we've got it open. Again, works aren't going on at the moment because of the COVID-19 issue, but we hope to get that moving as quickly as possible, again, with the support of the um, National Lottery Heritage Fund. Now, whilst we're doing these big projects, I don't want you to get the impression that we're not fulfilling our core purpose as well, which is um, taking on highly listed churches um, which no longer have a viable use as a, with a congregation, and there is no other way they can be converted to anything easy. So last year, uh, we took on another three, and we generally take on three or four uh, historic churches every year. On average, we spend about £300,000 on each vesting. And so when we take the building on, and we immediately get on site to make sure that it's watertight uh, and we invest that money up front because every pound we spend there saves us a lot of money down the line if we were to do the job um, over a number of years. Uh, there's a dedicated fund from the church commissioners to help us undertake this um, but sometimes you notice that there are churches that come with a much higher price than this and one investing we took on recently cost 1.6 million pounds so as you can see there's kind of a um, quite a few vested churches we could have taken for that price and again it's all about how the building's cared for where the building is it just reinforces to me the real importance of ongoing and regular maintenance of historic church buildings the more you do your regular maintenance the less the massive repair bill that you get when you need to transfer the ownership of these particular buildings but here you can see uh, the glory of the chancel arch in Tickingcote in Rutland um, a beautiful church up near the coast in Withensea in Yorkshire and and then Hemington in Somerset which again a very beautiful and classic um, Somerset church that you can see uh, at the bottom. So this really brings me on to the next 50 years and, and in a way I'd like to sort of couch this in terms of um, what happens to um, churches uh, moving on from COVID-19 as well. So um, we put together a new strategy which we launched last year um, which is really engaged at um, so how do we help and support communities care for their historic place of worship? And the reason we said this is because although we have a responsibility to look after them on behalf of the nation, you can't look after these buildings remotely. You need to be there. And the, the people who are going to care for these things most are the people who have connections. And those connections may well be through geography. It may be through family, uh, maybe through the family history or people just fall in love with a particular church building as well. But we think they need to be kind of, people need to go into them. They need to use them in the best way that they possibly can. And so the central pillar of our strategy is about supporting communities to use and love their places of worship. And this is about getting in there, uh, using them for concerts, uh, tea and cake is going to be a great thing that people always use them for, but bringing communities together, which is obviously very difficult at this time, and also allowing communities to support them to raise the money that's needed for the ongoing regular maintenance. And we have a collection of 15 local community officers around the country whose job it is to liaise with communities and support them in looking after and using and loving their historic places of worship. And once communities are using and loving these buildings, there, there is quite a, a bond. That, that builds and that is not only financial but it's also um, the fact that people are there on site to volunteer and take care of these buildings and, and love them in the future. 
the second part of our strategy is really about sharing our skills so this is all about uh, champing if you haven't been champing we hope you can go later this year but definitely you'll be able to go next year uh, champing.co.uk a new tourism product where you can go and stay in our churches overnight in a beautiful medieval church all to yourself um, which has proved very very popular uh, and we're very keen to keep this going although we're hit by COVID-19 as we are at the moment we have a good thriving consultancy service through mostly through our regeneration team we do lots of filming um, have quite exciting movies shot in our buildings and we also have a maintenance service which we help other people look after their historic places of worship um, particularly we've got Quakers in Norfolk whose buildings we take care for and also we are running the Historic Chapels Trust at the moment who have a collection of 20 um, non-Anglican buildings around the country and the third bit really is my appeal to all of you is that these historic church buildings are nothing unless society values them and it's really important that we all promote how important these buildings are even if we can't get into them at the moment I can still see one two in fact from my garden uh, where I live at the moment uh, and they're really important beacons in the landscape and they they are the place that tells the story of the place that they stand they're very de they're the most democratic of historic buildings and they tell a story of, of national local and international politics in the shape of the buildings and there's stories about the local people who are there from the poorest to the richest and it's really important that society really understands that and we can help more people love these buildings because I don't see anyone go into a building into one of our churches and go uh, I don't like that building they generally go in and go I've never been in here before what a beautiful space uh, and what a beautiful building and it works these buildings work on us on several different layers from the art and architecture the genius loci the sense of place that there is in them and that sense of heritage and history I think we do face a, an increasing challenge particularly in the countryside now where most of our grade one and grade well 70 percent of grade one and grade two star listed buildings are churches in the countryside um, and that's where the population is it's it's its oldest uh, and uh, least density and so in order to get people to help them look after these buildings there is quite an issue at this stage and there's some worry uh, about how these buildings will reopen even well our buildings we know we can reopen because we have the infrastructure to do it but i think there's lots of parish churches out there um, that maybe there may be questions as to whether they will be able to open again um, following COVID-19. We don't know the answer to that. I'm not saying that it's definite that they won't, but there, there is a concern that there might be, it might accelerate a, uh, the question of closure across the country. So we need to be ready. And our strategy is really uh, here to say, you know, we're here, we want to share our expertise uh, and the skills we've learned the hard way through doing this for 50 years to support communities to use and love their historic places of worship in whatever way we can do to do that but in order to do that we need funding um, and um, although we have a great relationship with the, the Department for Digital Culture Media and Sport and the Church Commissioners uh, there's always more that we can do uh, and our consultancy our, our commercial work brings us money but we do also rely on people donating to support these amazing historic churches so if you're watching now please do, um, do if you feel moved enough please do donate to support our work to make sure that these buildings are available Able to uh, people well into the future and continue to tell the story of the place where they are. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Well, thank you ever so much, Peter. Um, I hope everyone watching um, at home on Facebook really enjoyed um, that talk from our chief executive. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to open it up to questions. Um, so as I said earlier, please do comment on Facebook, um, use that chat box there and submit um, any questions you have for our chief executive. Um, I'm just going to have a quick look here. I know we've had a couple um, come through. Um, thanks firstly to the British Medieval Christian Tradition for sharing this in their, um, in their group. Um, please do um, share this obviously with your friends. Um, Peter, um, what, um, how many churches have you visited in the collection of CCT and what is your favourite? Oh, that's a very difficult question. I don't have a favourite, obviously, uh, but if I was pushed to say there's one that means more to me than maybe the others, uh, it would be Aldwinkle in Northamptonshire. Um, this was the world's first champing church. Um, the poet laureate John Dryden was 
born in the rectory across the road from it. Uh, it's a beautiful Northamptonshire church in a, in a beautiful piece of countryside, uh, not too far from where I've been living for a while, uh, but it is, it is an amazing one. We have 356 across the country and I have visited the vast majority of them. There are a few, mostly in our west region that I've not been so actively in, in seeing uh, and there's always always more but I haven't seen yet our new vesting in Withensea as well St Nicholas Withensea and I was I had a date to go up and see this building before uh, COVID-19 came in and I'm pretty gutted that I didn't get to go up there because I'm very keen to see um, any of the new ones in our collection as well as catching up with all of the old ones. Um, we have also, can I just say, we have an amazing collection of um, friends groups around the country, friends and volunteers and supporters, and it's such a joy always visiting these people in their buildings uh, and, and the amazing love they have for them and, and the, one's experience is always enhanced by meeting these people who are so dedicated to their churches. Brilliant. Um, we've had a question here on through Facebook. Um, do we require trustees? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, we have a board of trustees uh, as part of our establishment. Um, these are crown appointments, so the Queen appoints these people to the board. So it's quite a complex process, um, uh, which I'll just share with you my bureaucratic nightmare of appointing trustees. So they have to be nominated by the archbishops, that's both of them. Uh, then they have to go through a recruitment process where we're happy uh, with them. Then they go to um, the cabinet office, so number 10 Downing Street has to ratify them, and then the Queen. Uh, has to agree uh, and then we get a trustee so it's quite an important trustee board um, and we're very blessed with having um, the most incredible amount of talent on that board uh, and our chairman Peter Ainsworth um, leads them extremely well. Brilliant, um, thanks for that question we've had another one come in, um, which CC church did you first visit and which have you visited most recently? So um, the first CCT church I consciously visited uh, was St. Peter's in Northampton. Um, maybe giving you a clue of where I live. Um, uh, this is one of the finest Norman churches in the country. Um, the um, quality of the carvings of the capitals is, is truly breathtaking. There's not a single Christian um, icon that we can see in these capitals it looks distinctly pagan and pretty um uh, i don't know saxon and vikingy um i don't know the two things are exclusive but uh, there, there, there's a mixture there and there's also a, a very very considerable piece of um viking looking carving uh, in a tomb slab which may or may not be related to um a martyred saint uh, who was celebrated there um saint Mal no, what was his name oh said oh i'm gonna i forgot his name that's terrible i'll look it up in a second um but um saint peter's is is brilliant and the second part of the question was where did i visit most recently so um on my bike uh doing my exercise during lockdown i've been cycling past st peter's and st paul's preston deanery uh in northamptonshire again a very beautiful church in the countryside out in the countryside Fantastic. Well, I'm glad you're getting out to um, visit some churches. And as I said to everyone, um, we're about to launch um, some, or we have launched, should I say, on our website, a collection of free walks and cycle routes for you to safely visit some of our churches from the, exi out from the exterior um, so that you can do some exercise, but also get to experience and view some beautiful churches under our care. I see we've had some more questions. Um, how many chapels do we have in our care? Well, I'd like, to, well, as soon as I can't talk to the person directly, I'm going to assume, make an assumption. So if I'm wrong, do come back in the chat. Uh, if you're saying chapels, do you mean non Anglican churches? So I'll start with that answer. Um, our collection is entirely Anglican churches. So the legislation which sets us up deals exclusively with Church of England churches. However, we do have the largest chapel of ease in the country, uh, which is St. Nicholas um, Kings Lynn, which is truly breathtaking. It's the size of a small cathedral and a real triumph of perpendicular architecture. So we'll go and visit that as well, because it's a, an incredible piece of, of work. Um, but it is a chapel of ease, but it's still an Anglican chapel of ease. Um, in relation to um, perhaps non-conformist chapels, um, we have for the last two years been um, running ex ex uh, with the board for the board 
board of trustees of the historic chapels trust we've been providing their executive and staffing um, and we're seeking you know the best way forward for that charity as well so they have got a collection of 20 non-anglican churches across the country uh, they include uh, catholic churches they include uh, friends meeting houses unitarian chapels uh, and the like um, an, an amazing collection actually of very very beautiful chapels so i hope that answers your question um as Peter said there, if, if you've got any questions, sort of want to come back to that, um, please do comment again. Peter, we've had another question come in here. Um, how do we decide which churches we take into our care? Well, that is a very good question. Um, um, the, the church commissioners very generously give us the churches that we have. Uh, and we have no choice as to whether we take them or not. We are given them. Uh, there, there is some money attached to, to that as well, to, which helps. Um, but there's a process um, called, uh, and the legislation is called the pastoral measure, if you want to look it up. That governs the closing of uh, Church of England churches in this country and also provides the articles and memorandum of the church's conservation trust. So we're part of the closure method. And it's quite a lengthy process and can take up to five years. So the first part of that, is that a parish will decide that it can't a pcc will will move that it doesn't it can't keep the church open uh, the the building then uh, is passed to the diocese to hold and care during what's called the waiting period who then with the church commissioners they try and find a use for this particular building if the building's of significant uh, historic quality and they, there's no other use that can be found for it then it's a candidate to come to the church's conservation trust and as a consideration the commissioners decide and then we get the building i hasten to add we have an extremely good relationship with the church commissioners and we don't just get given things we do have a, a dialogue and debate and and we meet them every quarter looking at the list of potential vestings that are coming to uh, the church's conservation trust but ultimately uh, we have no choice about what we get so i hope that answers the question and as you can see it's quite a complicated and complex process of churches coming to us peter there's two questions that i think um, are quite similar so i'm going to put these together um will the trust um, as in Church Conservation Trust, be badly affected financially by COVID-19? And what support can people give? Well, that's a perfect question to ask at this time. Um, so we are quite significantly affected by um, COVID-19 in terms of income. Uh, this is the period where we make um, most of our money through donations and activity. And as you can imagine, um, nobody's visiting our churches, so therefore our wall safe taking and donations made at churches are down. This is also the time when we get the tea and cakes out around our churches all the communities there uh, been planning events for ages you know, spring opening and into the summer those are when all those events take place um, we also have historic church tours we obviously have champing which can't take place and so there's quite a big dent in our income we we estimate at this stage is about half a million pounds of lost income that we've got this year which is pretty serious um, although we are very lucky to have statutory funding that only forms half of our funding uh, the other half is money that we raise um, through donations through working with trusts and foundations and through our commercial activity so um, the way you can help is um, please get involved and please uh, donate um, money as is, is probably the most immediate way that you can help um, tell your friends about the work of the trust um, make sure that when we open you go and visit our churches and tell other people to go um, and make sure you hold them in in your mind as you go uh, and help support the work of the Churches Conservation Trust. But you can also become a supporter. Uh, you can sign up for our, our newsletter very easily if you wish to. And then there are several tiers of membership which you can join us so you can give us an annual sum to support our work. And we'd be very pleased to have you and you get all sorts of benefits from that, from our extremely high quality Pinnacle magazine um, through to um, access to our repair works on site and talking to our staff uh, and uh, discounts on our absolutely fabulous historic church tours which will start again soon brilliant um and as peter said there you can become a member of cc and we've been really overwhelmed by the generosity and support of a lot of our members so thank you so much to all of our members who have been helping us out peter i think we've got a couple a bit of time for a couple more questions so again if you've got any last minute questions please do comment on in our comments on our facebook there um one question here peter but um what do you think the greatest threat to the parish churches in england 
<laughs> well, that's a, well, gravity, if, I, if I'm really honest. Uh, the biggest problem that churches have is the fact that gravity pulls bits of them off over time, but I'm being frivolous. Uh, I think, um, well, it's a tricky time. As I said before, I think that um, predominantly in rural areas, there is this, this issue that there are lots of the vast majority of grade one and grade two stuff. So the most highly listed, most historic churches in, in parts of the country where there's the lowest population density and also the, um, the most elderly population as well. And you can see the statistics. Interestingly, in, 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 um, in rural areas, there's a disproportionately high amount of church attendance compared to urban areas. But because the population density is so low, there are low, um, there are low uh, attendance numbers as well. And it's very hard for a group of less than 10 um, uh, uh, communicators or, or, or members of the church who are probably getting on it in, in years to look after you know a 14th century church building or even earlier it involves quite a lot of work and so it involves raising money for it um, and it involves the daily care that's needed as well and it's the collapse of that community support for the building which I think is the most tricky and most difficult issue um, and I think we need to be uh, mindful about how we can support communities use and love these buildings and, and I feel if we don't provide an infrastructure of support for people um, how would you know how to care for this building and also the bigger threat is as less people um, potentially go to church um, on a Sunday less people are having an interaction with these buildings and might feel that um, uh, they're, they can't cross the threshold because they're not religious. And as I say, I think it's really important that we express to society that these buildings are for everybody. The parish church in this country is peculiar in many ways uh, in that um, because of the state of the church, the, the, the parish church is a resource for everybody because you live there. And it doesn't matter what you believe, where you come from, what your sexuality or gender is, that building is actually there for you. Um, and I think it's really important that we keep telling that story to people and say, this building is part of the fabric of your life. This is where this this is telling the story why would you be the the uh, the generation that lets this story go because i think they are very profound in their relationship to the place that they are and so after a very rambling answer where's my conclusion i think the biggest threat to historic parish churches is that they become irre largely irrelevant to society and we've got to fight that and we've got to support them uh, in the long term. Cash will help a lot, but actually, I think if society doesn't value them, then we're in really big trouble. These buildings need people. Go and use them, go and support them. They're really great things. Brilliant. Thanks, Peter. Um, I've just got two more questions here that I think we'll probably cover. Um, so you said that Bolton All Souls is a really good example of how the Church's Conservation Trust um, is being supported by a diverse community locally there. CCT churches might not necessarily be the first places that spring to mind as a place for people to volunteer. How do the CCT promote that these buildings are for everyone, especially in the contracts of attracting new volunteers? Is it something that is particularly emphasised with our regeneration projects? I think uh, it's, it's an interesting question. I think the, the, um, the regeneration projects give you an ability um, to, to focus a lot of attention in one one particular place because of the scale of investment that goes in and you get uh, you can therefore support quite a big uh, staff uh, team uh, a concentration of effort around one particular place and, and the majority of our well, yeah, pretty much all of our um, regeneration projects so far have been in um, in cities or big towns, basically, uh, where there are more diverse communities um, to uh, to engage and get involved in. But the principles of what we've learned in our regeneration um, in our regeneration work has really filtered into the work that we do uh, out there in the community um, and we work very very hard um, to make sure that communities are are able to engage with the work we do and uh, there's a wide variety of ways that people can can volunteer now we have this network of 15 local community officers across the country whose job it is to support communities and go and find people who are happy to help uh, help out and support them as well so that's one way that we go 
about this. We get a lot of people approach us because they have a curiosity uh, and they've seen some of our work and they, they feel there's something they can do there. Uh, and we have a network of um, area volunteers, as we call them. And these guys are brilliant. They, they go and they get a, given a patch of churches and they go around and they do, they visit them regularly and check that they're all okay. And they, they engage with them through, through that way. Uh, we have interns that we work with as well, support people in the early days of their career um, uh, through, through working with us as well. Um, we have uh, all of our trustees are also volunteers tiers as well which is really important to remember uh, so we have the whole gamut really and there's no end of things that we can find uh, for people to support us with and help just recently we wrote a very um, technical paper on issues of maintenance and um, uh, uh, that was mostly written by one of our volunteers who happens to have a background in management consulting who, who offered their time so there's everything from um, sweeping the buildings out to um, very complex management reports that we use volunteering and everything in between but what's really important is that we keep eating cake and drinking tea uh, and supporting and saying thank you and I am genuinely grateful for all of the volunteering that we have in the trust we're again very blessed by the people that we have and their commitment to their churches or in fact to the work of the CCT as well. Brilliant. Well as you heard there from Peter um, there's lots of opportunities for what you can do when you volunteer for us. Um, if you want to find out about how to volunteer with the Church Conservation Trust, you can actually find quite a lot of information on our website, which is visitchurches.org.uk. And that's a really great website where you can also find um, a CC church near to you. Peter, I think we're going to finish with just this final question, because I think this is quite a, a pertinent question given the current lockdown. Um, how important do you think CCT churches, and indeed churches in general, are to people's well-being? Well, I'm going to lump them all together because I think um, there's no distinct... Well, the CCT churches are... The only difference is that they're all highly listed, but there are lots of churches. I... Uh, well, I think the evidence proves that they're, they're really important to people's well-being. Um, I think a lot of studies have been, been, been made about um, having a sense of place uh, is actually very important to your feeling of rootedness um, which relates to certain things of stimuli around you and historic churches really fulfill that um, declaring a sense of, of place uh, and an identity related to to a place because all of these buildings all across the country are unique um, they might look similar in some cases but they're all completely unique uh, they were built in different times in different ways with different elements and added on in different ways as well telling the story of that place and you can visit them and see that continuity uh, that exists in them. Uh, also, they are wonderful places to visit. Um, the quieter ones where you're in the middle of nowhere or in, even in a city centre where there are quiet spaces where you can take the time to sit down and just breathe and respond to the building in whichever way you want. That might be through a spiritual way, it might be just through mindfulness, it might be just through breathing. Um, these places are, are really, really helpful in regard to that. Uh, hubs of volunteering, again, volunteering and being part of a community is hugely important to your well-being and sense of place and, and, and your, your identity again. Um, and, and churches, historic churches and churches in general offer that opportunity to commune with other people and be part of something, uh, which I think is really, really helpful. And then there are places of great beauty. And I think beauty is important to, well, it's certainly important to my well-being, I think, being able to see the amazing pieces of architecture um, and art that are represented in these buildings, which is incredible given we probably lost 90% of our religious art during the Reformation, that so much does actually survive uh, and has been added to over the years as well. And there's the, just the most incredible things that appear in these buildings. I was sent a picture this week of um, a painting by John Piper of a wolf and coat um, uh, a, a beautiful little church that we own which Betjeman uh, visited with Piper um, and um, just that piece of art really it was evocative of the space that I'd been to and my mental well-being was vastly increased so it's about taking part it's about experiencing things uh, and uh, it's about that sense of place so all in all they are genuinely the most amazing historic buildings that there are so why would we not support love them and make sure they're used into the well into the future well, i think that's a fantastic message to finish on 
Um, thank you so much to everyone who has joined us today, especially to those of you watching via Facebook. Um, if you've got ideas for lectures that you'd like us to put on for you, um, or any particular topics that you'd like to learn more about, um, please do comment in the box below, um, and we'll have a look at those and see what we can do. But do keep an eye on our website. Um, we're about to announce um, a new series of lectures that we're putting on. This was the very first one. We've got some fantastic um, people lined up, including Dr. Emma Wells, Professor Paul Binsky, and Dr. Christina Welch, um, who are going to be putting on some fascinating lectures, which will all be free to attend and get involved with. Um, but as I said, thank you so much for watching. And please, if you feel so inclined to do, please do click um, on the donate button or you can text CCT to 70331 and that will donate three pounds um, to help us care and protect for our nation's heritage. But thank you so much. And if you've got any questions, do get in touch.